It's our 50th episode! Whoa, that's awesome. What do you get for your 50th anniversary? Gold? Yeah, it's gold. Someone bring me something gold! Whoa, a golden sculpture of my head? Wow, thanks. You shouldn't have. Wait, is this actually chocolate? Even better. But seriously, folks, thank you for taking this ride with us. We've got plenty more planned for the future, but we couldn't do it without you, so thanks. And also thanks to all of our friends who have been a part of the show and lent their talents in so many ways. I'm a lucky guy. Speaking of friends, my wife and I really like to go to the ballet. And here in Louisville, we have a really great ballet company, the Louisville Ballet. And my friend Ashley Thursby happens to be a dancer with the company. So I told her I was going to write a piece about Maria Tallchief, a dancer who was a member of the Osage Nation. And she said, I studied with her when I was young. So... I just dropped a microphone off on Ashley's porch, and she was kind enough to read the story. So how awesome is that? The second story of the episode comes to us from 1518, a mysterious event known as the Dancing Plague. Bunch of people just started dancing and couldn't stop. Might seem fake, but there are a lot of accounts for the event. We'll take you there. But first, a little history of dance. Catherine de' Medici was born in 1519 to one of the most important families of Renaissance Italy. The Medicis were rich and politically powerful, but they were not royalty. Catherine would change that. In a typical power wedding of international power families, she married up when she exchanged vows with King Henry II of France. Her husband would eventually die because he partied too hard at another wedding. It was his daughter's. You see, Henry II thought he'd show off his jousting skills at the party, and it all kind of blew up in his face literally. After that, three of her sons would sit on the French throne. But these crowned heads were not the greatest gift she gave France, and by default, the world. She also brought the seeds of ballet to France from the Italian high society. In fact, the word ballet comes from her native tongue, the Italian word ballare, which means to dance. Catherine so loved the dances that took place at lavish events in Italy, When costumed dancers performed for the lucky attendees along with the rich courses of fancy meals, usually the courtiers would learn the choreography or the arrangements of dance moves and join in as well. She loved it so much that when she married Henry II, she insisted that the French court learn the dances as well. And before long, it was a part of regular French life in court, which really meant only rich and privileged people got to see it. A century later, a new French king, King Louis XIV, helped take dance to a new level. The costumes became more elaborate, and he employed incredible dance masters. The choreography became more demanding and beautiful. A stage and set pieces were regularly used, and often, each performance told a story. In short, what began as entertainment for rich people at dinner slowly began to resemble the ballet that we know today. And Louis wasn't just a fan, he was a dancer himself. In fact, his nickname, the Sun King, actually came from a role he danced in one of his beloved ballets. Before he died, he founded the first ballet school in France, and for centuries, the French would lead the way in the art form. At the same time this dancing king was ruling France, a few colonies in America had slowly taken root. But no one could have known that one of the most remarkable figures in dance would eventually be born in America and to people whose ancestors had been there long before the first Europeans. The Osage Nation of Native Americans originally lived in the Ohio and Mississippi River Valleys of the United States. Around the time of European arrival on the continent, the Osage migrated west of the Mississippi, largely due to conflicts with both the newly arrived as well as the Iroquois people. By the 1800s, they, like many other native tribes, were forced to relocate again, this time by an American government who desired the land they had begun calling home. An area in present-day Oklahoma was set aside for the Osage, called a reservation. Then came a surprise. Oil was discovered on this new Osage land. Unusual was the fact that the Osage had purchased and owned the land on which the reservation sat. Furthermore, the tribal leaders had successfully negotiated for the rights to anything valuable that might lie below the surface. And oil was extremely valuable. 
By the early 1900s, members of the Osage Nation were quite wealthy because of the natural resource underneath their feet. Not King of France wealthy, but wealthy enough to live in big, nice homes and enjoy plenty of the finer things in life. One of these families was the family of Maria Tallchief. She was born in Fairfax, Oklahoma in 1924, and her mother, who had grown up poor, wanted Maria to have every opportunity she had not. At the age of three, she enrolled her daughter in dance lessons, and as soon as her little sister Marjorie was old enough, she joined Maria, who was known as Betty Marie at the time. It wasn't just dance. The girls learned piano, too. Many days, other kids from the neighborhood would come by and peek in their window, wondering why the sister could not join them for games and fun. There, they would see the girls hard at work. Betty Marie was a very good student in school, and most of the hours not occupied by school were occupied with music and dance. Her mother adored musicals and dreamed that the sisters would be stars someday. Before long, their dance teacher had the sisters performing at every county fair and rodeo in the area. When there was a break in their busy schedule, their Osage grandmother would sneak them off to traditional tribal celebrations. Under the broad Oklahoma sky, Young Betty Marie would see the men and women dancing along to the steady beat of drums and singing the songs that had been passed down by tradition for centuries. It was something she'd remember all of her life. Oklahoma didn't have everything the family desired, though. At the age of eight, her parents decided to move to Los Angeles. While the idea of California was exciting, they really didn't have much of a plan. One day... Tired and hungry from driving, they stopped for hamburgers. Their mother asked the restaurant owner if he knew of any dance instructors in the area. He did, so they stayed. According to Maria's recollection as an adult, it was as simple as that, and completely by chance. They just stayed. The girls studied with that teacher for a while, until a newcomer to town opened another dance school. Again, by chance. She was known as Madame Najinska, and she would change Maria's life. Bronslava Najinska was from Poland and had gained worldwide recognition for her dancing with the Ballet Russe and her adventurous choreography. But to Maria Tallchief, she was just the old lady who took dance way more seriously than anyone she had met and who spoke almost no English. Maria soon realized there was more than met the eye when it came to her new dance teacher. Maria paid attention whenever an internationally famous dance company came to Los Angeles for performances. She also watched with wide eyes as one by one the visiting dancers would come by the studio to meet Madame Najenska and pay their respects. Maria's jaw dropped when one of the most famous dancers in the world walked through the door with a bouquet of roses for her teacher. Before long, Maria committed herself and became Madame Najenska's star pupil. After graduating high school, Maria crossed the country on a train bound for New York with a family friend. Once in the big city, she found the office of the man who was in charge of the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo, the famed European company which had relocated to America during World War II. He remembered Betty Marie from one of Madame Najinska's classes and offered her a spot for a Canadian tour without even auditioning. This was a big deal. In the beginning, she was a minor part of the troupe. It takes a while to work your way up in a dance company, and some never do. There's often fierce competition. Many of the company's dancers had come from Europe and were often unkind to her. At the time, Europe was the leader in dance, especially France and Russia. Never had an American been respected much alongside such artists like these. She was even urged to change her name, as many found Tall Chief to be such an unusual name for even an American dancer. They thought it would hold her back. A stage name like Maria Talcheva, they said, would be close enough to her real name, but carry the benefit of sounding vaguely Russian. It might open doors for her, they explained, but she refused. She was proud of her Osage family and would never hide her heritage. The only concession she made was to go by Maria rather than Betty Marie. Despite the obstacles of the occasionally unkind dance partner and ruffled brows when she was introduced by name, 
Maria Tallchief had remarkable talent, and she worked hard to improve every day. When one of the principal dancers had to leave suddenly just before a new performance, the spot was offered to Maria. As had happened so many times in her life, a chance event gave her an opportunity. But it was her hard work, dedication, and pure love of dance that allowed her to succeed. From this moment on, the sky was the limit for Maria. She fell in love with a choreographer named George Balanchine, who was one of the most famous in the world, and he created some of his most memorable roles specifically for her. He founded the now world-famous New York City Ballet, and she would eventually be the prima ballerina, the first Native American to hold such a title with a major company. Still today, dancers all over the world perform roles and learn the choreography that she originated, including the lead role in The Firebird. Likewise, she set the standard for the Sugar Plum Fairy in The Nutcracker. Without a doubt, she was the most famous and one of the most important American dancers of her time. Not bad for a girl from the Osage Reservation in the middle of Oklahoma. After her retirement from the stage, she and her sister co-founded the Chicago Ballet, another important American company. She also dedicated herself to teaching a new generation, just as Madame Najinska had done. In fact, when I was a young dancer, I had the honor to meet and learn from Maria Tallchief in Taos, New Mexico. My mother had told me what an honor it was to be learning from her, and I'm happy she did, especially because I might have seen her as just the old lady who took dance way more seriously than anyone I had ever met. Well, okay, for You Have 30 Seconds this month, we're going to send it up to Canada and Hartley. Hartley, take it away. Hi, my name is Hartley. I'm from Victoria, B.C. Wayne Gretzky is a retired pro hockey player born in 1961 in Brantford, Ontario. He played most of his hockey career with the Edmonton Oilers and the Los Angeles Kings. He scored more goals, assists, and points than anyone else in NHL history. He won dozens of awards and four Stanley Cups. He currently holds 61 hockey records. Yeah, Wayne Gretzky was pretty awesome. Thanks, Hartley. And if you have someone awesome or something awesome that you think that you can fit into 30 seconds, then record it. Simple. We have instructions on our website, thepastandthecurious.com, and then you can send it our way, and we have a growing body of those. And when the time is right, we'll pop it into an episode. Ja, wir tanzen jetzt. It's quiz time. It's quiz time. It's quiz time. It's a dance-related quiz, don't you know? So, the first question. In 1986, 119,986 people set a dance-related world record. What on earth? What record did they set? On March 13, 1986, 119,986 people created the longest conga line in the world. It is known as the Miami Super Conga. More recently, a small group of people set another conga record when they weren't the longest conga line, but they traveled the longest distance as a conga line, over 15 miles. Well, all right then, smarty pants. Do you know what insect communicates with others of its species by dancing? Honeybees do a very specific movement called the waggle dance. The figure eight pattern will show others in the colony the exact direction and distance of flowers that have nectar and pollen. It's totally amazing. And at the end of the episode, I'm going to direct you to some kids listen resources so you can learn more about that because it's mind blowing. But right now, question number three. Misty Copeland is probably the most famous ballet dancer in America today. In 2015, she became the first black woman to be a principal dancer for the illustrious American Ballet Theater in New York. But do you know how old she was when she started dancing? Most dancers start very young, but Misty did not begin studying dance until she was 13, which is remarkably late. 
She was convinced to try it through her local girls and boys club, and her talent and dedication soon appeared, and she never looked back. She has since been featured in countless publications for children and adults. Quite an inspiration. At some points in history, it has been a part of Germany. Other times, it's been a part of France. But for a while, in 1518, the city of Strasbourg was simply the epicenter of dance. Dance and confusion, that is. Eventually, the dancing ended, one way or another. But 500 years later, the confusion remains. Strasbourg is a city that sits on the border of Germany and France. For centuries, it was part of the German Empire, but then it flip-flopped back and forth with nearly every conflict between the two nations. France. Germany. France. Germany. France again. Germany again. And then finally, France. after World War II. Today, it's a cultural connection and a sign of goodwill between the two neighboring nations. But it's really appropriate that it's French, because in 1792, a composer living there wrote La Marseille, a song which is now the French national anthem. It'd be weird if France's national anthem was actually written by a dude from Germany, I think. Of course, way back in 1518, the city was part of the Holy Roman Empire, and pretty much German. But if the residents might have ever had the chance to hear La Marseille, perhaps beamed back centuries by a German wormhole, Ein wormhole? well, they might have done the only thing they knew how to do. Dance. Look, the 1500s in Strasbourg were pretty bad. Okay, they were really bad. First, there was a plague. A regular plague, not a dancing plague. You've probably heard of it, the Black Death or the Bubonic Plague. The disease threatened the town, which in the end had it much easier than much of Europe. But word traveled about this terrible affliction, putting a lot of people in the grave. So they knew what was coming, and it did to a degree. Luckily for Strasbourg, some terribly cold winters came along too, and this slowed the plague in the area greatly. See, the disease was carried by fleas, and when it gets really cold, fleas don't want to do much, including passing on gross deadly diseases. Now I want you to note, almost all flea bites these days only bring an itchy bite. But if they were ever to give someone something worse like the bubonic plague, well, there's a simple cure now. But really, don't worry about catching it yourself. Unless you play with wild animals in the middle of nowhere, you probably won't get it. It's nearly impossible. I tell you this because once I accidentally gave a kid nightmares by saying that there are still a few very, 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 very few cases of the bubonic plague each year. Fear not, my friends. Anyway, the flea freezing weather had some bad effects too. Mostly, you know, it was really cold, and really cold in the 1500s could be pretty rough. Smoky homes still let in the winter, but more importantly, the food those cold survivors grew and farmed for themselves was left in rough shape. So people were starving, and they didn't have money to buy more food. Starving citizens or not, the local church, which served as the town government, still collected taxes. It didn't matter that many people had nothing to their name, so little money and little food left little hope. So you see, the town was under a lot of stress. Then there were a few years of crazy hot weather with almost no rain. This meant the crops they were finally able to grow were stunted. Whatever had started to bloom and blossom wound up putrefying on the vine. And this just left people hungrier and poorer. The church government still insisted on collecting taxes, though. Obviously, they were due for a reformation. People were hungry, in debt, untrusting of their town government, and, in short, supremely stressed out. Something had to give. And so it did. Frau Trofea was a resident of the town who suffered all of these trying circumstances, and it appears that she had had enough. Stepping out of her home and into the sweltering summer heat of July 14th, she started to dance. It was strange to the town folk, many of whom stopped to watch. There was no music. At least, not that they could hear. 
What was she on about? Was she angry at her husband and thought this would embarrass him, some thought? Was she possessed? It was a peculiar mystery. The lady just danced, like all day long. And when her body was finally exhausted, she fell asleep. The people who had seen it assumed that after a good night's sleep, she would wake up and return to her usual self. Were they right? They were worse than right. They were wrong. With the new day, she danced her silent dance harder than she had the day before, and she continued to do so in the days that followed. But Frau Trofea was more than just a dancing fool. She was like the center of a growing snowball because day by day, more and more people inexplicably danced alongside her. An ever-growing number of people bobbed and danced and twirled deep in trance. They continued through cramped legs, sore ankles, even bloody feet from the constant motion. Now, people had heard of similar things happening before, groups of people being compelled to dance. It was called the Dancing Plague. And here it is, ladies and gentlemen. It's the hottest hit from all days, 1518. Dancing Plague, proud fails, dancing in the street. The plague caught on, now everybody's dancing till they have bloody One month later, the number of people who were moved to, um, moved, is said to have swelled, just like their sore feet were doing, to 400. Yeah, they're tons and yet. The people of town who weren't in a dance trance were really worried. Many people got hurt, even if you died of exhaustion from the constant dancing with little food or sleep. At the time, medicine was still influenced by Greek and Roman ideas on health. One big part of this view of the body was an idea called the four humors. It is said that all people contained four different bodily fluids, and illnesses were caused when these fluids were out of balance. There was black bile, Ew. yellow bile, Yuck. phlegm, Ugh. and blood. Ugh. It was a problem with the blood, the doctors in town said. They elaborated that the dancing people were out of balance, and their blood was hot. Thank goodness we know more about illnesses today than we did back then. Now, what was the cure for hot blood in this case, you might ask? Well, the worried wallflowers of Strasbourg asked that too. And the doctors replied, more dancing, of course. So they built a stage, brought in professional dancers, and even hired a band. The band tried playing fast. Maybe that would wear them out, and they'd finally stop. No dice. The poor dancers, despite being physically exhausted, kept dancing. So the band played really slowly. Perhaps they'd lulled them to sleep. Again, no dice. The dance-a-thon showed no signs of letting up. Yeah, we're tons in Imarnock. People whirled, people twirled. Man and woman, boy and girl, their connection to the world unfurled. And this went on until September. The city leaders, who were not swept up in the craze, looked again for more answers to the dancers. After more and more people got hurt and even more died, they realized more dancing was probably not the solution. They thought that perhaps the city was now being punished by a power from above and that the townsfolk should atone for their sins. Step one was to ban dancing and music altogether. So the band packed up and left, and the leaders then tried to physically stop the remaining movers and shakers from moving and shaking. Finally, the remaining dancers were loaded onto a wagon and taken to a shrine for St. Vitus. Slowly, they began to calm down, and slowly, life returned to normal in Strasbourg. There were several instances of dancing plagues in Europe around this time, but this was the largest, the most well-documented, and the last. Fifteen years after it happened, a doctor came to town and recorded all that he could about what had happened while there were still witnesses alive to tell him. Had he not, we wouldn't have the details that we have now. As for what caused it, people have speculated many things, from possession to poisoning. But most historians agree that it was a result of incredibly stressed people living in a very superstitious time. Because of the lack of, uh, well, nearly everything, no relief from the local authorities, and really just no hope, Frau Trofea and many of her neighbors suffered from mass hysteria that caused them to ignore the pains in their bodies 
as they danced for days on end. We may never know exactly what happened, but it will probably never stop being fascinating. Because the world has changed, people handle hard situations in very different ways. A dancing plague sure seems strange today, but we weren't there, so we don't know what their lives were really like. Many of us handle stress in strange ways too. Somewhere in the future, someone might be confused by our behavior. All I know is that the next time I'm feeling stress, I'm gonna try dancing, but I'm also going to try to stop. Heaven, I'm in heaven And my heart beats so that I can hardly speak But I seem to find the happiness I seek When we're out together dancing cheek to cheek Heaven I'm in heaven And the cares that hung around me through the week Seem to vanish like a gambler's lucky streak When we're out together dancing cheek to cheek Oh, I'd love to climb a mountain and to reach the highest peak But it doesn't thrill me half as much As dancing cheek to cheek Oh, I'd love to go out fishing In a river or a creek But I don't enjoy it half as much As dancing cheek to cheek Dance with me I want my arm about you the charm about you will carry me through to heaven. I'm in heaven, and my heart beats so that I can hardly speak. But I seem to find the happiness I seek when we're out together dancing cheek to cheek Well, 50 episodes. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. That's awesome. I look forward to 50 more. Fingers crossed on all of that. Uh, thank you to Ashley. What a treat to have you. Uh, and someone who had a personal connection to someone as awesome as Maria Talchi. That is fantastic. Um, if you are curious about that bee dance, which I mentioned in quiz time, I have three recommendations for you. All are creations from our friends through Kids Listen. First, Brains On has an episode called The Buzz About Bees, Part 1, from September of 2020. Uh, also, our friends Time for Lunch, they have an episode called Pollinators from May of 2020. I recommend you find both of those if you want to learn more about bees. But also, our friends at Chompers have an, uh, they have a song. They do songs that are short that you brush your teeth to. Gives you the right amount of time to brush your teeth. And they have a song called Bees Can Talk by Moving Their Butts. And it is one of the, it's a house favorite here now. It didn't take any time. It's in all of our ears all the time. I will post links to all of those uh, on the website, thepastandthecurious.com. I also have to recommend, um, if you want to see some really awesome dance videos, you should go to thekidshouldseethis.com, my favorite website, uh, and type in the words ballet. Our friends there have created an incredible collection of stuff for you to enjoy. Okay, who's ready for shout outs? First, I need to shout out Colby and Claire. Colby, Colby and, and Claire. Claire. Thank Colby you. And Claire. Also, Mom Katie. And Katie. Thank you, too. So great. So happy that you all are out there listening. Now, I need to thank Nora. Nora. Nora, 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 and her dad, Paul. And Paul. Thank you both very, very much. Arava and Vered. Arava, Arava and Vered. You 
are awesome because you went and visited the site of Yaromamu's house on Dent Place from our last episode. Arava and Vered, awesome! Yeah! And Thomas and Lillian of San Rafael, California. Thomas and, Thomas and Lillian. Lillian. Lillian and Thomas. Hello to you in California. And last but not least, Carver. Carver. Carver, who I hear is named after George Washington Carver. Carver. How awesome is that? Carver. Carver, thank you very much. Glad you're listening. Now, uh, no one asked for it, but I imagine that you still do want to hear it, even though you didn't ask for it. So I'm going to leave you with a reprise of Dancing Plague, my spoof on Dancing Queen. Look, I worked really hard on it. And I'm kind of proud of it. So, you know, turn it off or dance along. Let's have a dance party real quick. Go. Dancing Plague, proud show fails, dancing in the street. The plague caught on, now everybody's dancing till they have bloody She hurt her leg, she caught the dancing plane.